a gathering of football's elite. As always, Sir Matt Busby stands out in a group without having to shout the odds. He's the most respected man in the game. I think you would notice that today with all the older players, maybe the younger players, and even Franz Beckenbauer spoke so highly of him. And even when he's in here, everybody mingles around him, don't they? His philosophy was if you score one, go and score two. If you get two, go and get three. If you get three, go and get four, go and get five. And that was him. It wasn't that a case of, well, we'll defend what we've got. You went out and attacked and attacked. The record is there, and in the manner in which it was done is more important. And there's two, the two things that are important in football, winning things, but doing it in the right way, and Sir Matt always did it the right way. He's probably the nicest human being I've ever met. He's one of those people, I mean, I remember my father going to Old Trafford for the first time, and he treated him like he was a king. And the next time he went back my father, he remembered his name, he remembered the name of the kids, he remembered what he drank, where he lived. He just had this talent for making people feel at home. And it wasn't just because he was my father, he did it with everybody. If Matt Busby came over here now and told us to try and run through that wall, we'd all attempt it. That was the respect we had for him. Busby's name is synonymous with Manchester United. The two are bound together in triumph and in tragedy. The softly spoken Scott captivated football followers everywhere as the manager who created a team of brilliant young players, the Busby Babes. And the heart of the nation went out to Busby and to Manchester United when many of that team perished in the Munich air disaster on the 6th of February, 1958. Busby hovered between life and death. Eight of his players, three members of the club staff and eight sports writers did not survive. For then, thoughts of winning the European Cup were cruelly cast aside. But amazingly, a patchwork United team put together by Busby's assistant, Jimmy Murphy, staggered on to play in the FA Cup final. Busby returned from hospital in Germany to build a new team, which was to achieve much of what the Babes had promised. During the 1960s, Busby signed Dennis Law and introduced George Best to join Bobby Charlton in Making Magic. Sartori. Charlton! And a goal! Bobby Charlton. Oh, good ball inside the fullback for Best. To best. Look at this for a little bit of acceleration. Oh, what a beautiful little chance to go! Off law. Fulfillment came ten years after the tragedy of Munich. United became the first English club to win the European Cup. Manchester, and there is Matt Busby. Tears in his eyes. The Matt Busby story begins far away from the glamour of Wembley. He was born here, in the Lanarkshire pit village of Orbiston, in 1909. Today, the main street is renamed Busby Road. I was born in a pitman's cottage. And the doctor who delivered me said, a footballer has come to this house this day. He may have said that about most of the boys with whom he delivered. <laughs> but in my case, it very nearly was proved wrong. Busby was to experience sorrow early in his life. His father and all his uncles were killed in the First World War. The need to supplement the family income prevented the young Busby from training to be a schoolteacher. When he's 15 years of age, he's seen the uh, hard times my mother was having, rearing six of us, four, four sisters, Matt and I. And he left Our Ladies High School at Motherwell at 15 years of age to go down a pit to help my mother out. He's, he's so. never regretted, not only been, never been a school teacher, he's, he's never regretted going down the pits, although he thinks it, it still taught him something in life to be grateful for any little small mercies. Professional football presented one of the few alternatives to coal mining, and Busby was keen to emulate two other local players, 
Alex James and Huey Gallagher. The ambition seemed a rather forlorn one during Busby's association with the local Hibs team, and the family planned to emigrate to the United States. My application for a visa at that time was delayed. And that delay changed the whole course of my life. Instead of emigrating to America, I emigrated to Manchester. <laughs> Manchester City signed Busby in February 1928. He received a weekly wage of five pounds during the season and four pounds during the summer. But his early days in English football were not particularly a source of happiness. For after two years, I was playing so badly that I almost, was almost in despair. Dr. Johnson said one time that much may be made of a Scotsman if he is caught young. <laughs> and I had decided that if much was to be made of me, it would appear I would have to try some other career other than football. Then suddenly, in an emergency, I was called upon to play right half-back in a Northern Midweek League game. And in that position, and from that moment, success came to me. Success with Manchester City was confirmed in the club's 2-1 victory over Portsmouth in the 1934 FA Cup final. Manchester City equalise. Cotton goes up half a point and a rainbow runs right through Manchester. The winning goal. Look at that Portsmouth player taking the ball out of the net. Hasn't his back got a sweet expression? The cup goes north. Two years after this, Busby was transferred to Liverpool. He was made the captain and is remembered as having had a paternal attitude toward the younger players. To them, he looked more like a bank manager than a professional footballer as he walked to Anfield in a fawn overcoat and a trilby, smoking a pipe. The war years revealed his instinctive qualities of leadership to an even greater extent. He attained the rank of company sergeant major. He also represented Scotland a number of times in matches arranged for the Red Cross. While serving in Italy, he was put in charge of the army team. After the war, he could have returned to Liverpool and taken a coaching job at Anfield. He chose instead to accept Manchester United's offer of a manager's office and an annual salary of £750. The offer was somewhat of an exaggeration. German bombs had destroyed the office and reduced much of the ground to rubble. Matt Busby, aged 35, arrived to find Old Trafford in ruins. It was not an easy assignment. The ground had been blitzed. There had an overdraft at the bank. What is more, I had very little experience. I had no experience as a manager. And I felt they were taking a great risk and appointed me. All I had, apart from playing experience, were certain ideas as to what the manager should do, faith in those ideas, and faith in the future of the club. Busby's first signing proved to be the most important one he made. He recruited Jimmy Murphy as his assistant. Murphy, a former player for West Bromwich Albion and Wales, had met Busby during wartime service. The iron Scottish diplomat and the Welsh drill sergeant were to become one of the game's great managerial partnerships. Busby, later renowned for his emphasis on youth, bought the balding, ageing Jimmy Delaney from Celtic for £4,000. It was a masterstroke. Delaney provided a supply line for Jack Rowley and Stan Pearson, one of the most successful post-war goal-scoring partnerships. Rowley, complemented by Pearson's subtlety, scored 175 goals in 359 league matches. But the most influential figure in the first of Busby's three United sides was the captain. Johnny Carey, who was the Republic of Ireland 
player and, and at that time was an immense player. Actually, he played in every position in the club except goalkeeper. But he was an inside forward and I converted him to a full back. And of course, from there, he was immense. And uh, not only that, he was a great help to me and a great captain. United were runners-up in the first division four times before the league title came Busby's way in 1952. The team is best remembered for winning the FA Cup in 1948, defeating Blackpool in the final. The old Lancashire finalists take the field at Wembley. Manchester United in dark shirts, Blackpool in white. It's the North's big day. Sunshine warms the stadium and 100,000 spectators settle themselves for an afternoon's enjoyment as the King greets the players with a friendly handshake. Manchester kickoff. Renowned slow starters, their match-winning attack seems to have lost the rhythm that has brought them along the road to Wembley. A close duel between Manchester's Johnny Carey and Blackpool's Water Ricket number 11 is highlight number one in a thrill-packed match. Highlight number two comes when Stan Mortensen is tripped in the penalty area and referee Barrick awards Blackpool a spot kick. As the crowd rise to cheer, Eddie Schimmel drives it home to give the Seasiders the lead. Manchester's Jack Rowley walking the ball into the net to equalise provides highlight number three. Blackpool settling down quicker than Manchester are overcoming their Wembley nerves. From a free kick and a seemingly impossible angle, Stanley Mortensen whips in a goal to give Blackpool the half-time lead. Blackpool kick off, confidently hoping that their 2-1 lead will bring them football's most coveted prize. Just to make sure, their skipper, Harry Johnson, number four, tries a long shot that doesn't come off, and the ball trickles out. But now Manchester's attack, which has scored 95 goals this season, swings into its best style. From Johnny Morris's well-placed free kick, the fans cheer Jack Rowley's headed equaliser. With the score at 2-all, Blackpool are again on the attack. Stanley Matthews, who has been shut out effectively, beats Manchester's Johnny Aston, but the Seasiders finishing is poor. Charlie Mitten, number 11, starts off United's winning attack, and from Rowley's pass, Stan Pearson scores the goal that gives Manchester the cup. The King hands the silver trophy to skipper Johnny Carey. Their 4-2 victory, snatched in the last few minutes, gives Manchester United the reward they richly deserve. Some contend that the 1948 team was Busby's finest. He had already established an intelligent approach to team management. This was acknowledged when he was invited to take charge of the British Olympic football team. He had set himself high standards to follow and a reputation as an innovative manager. He was very different. In other words, he was always with the players and understanding the players. And uh, when we assembled together at the cliff, um, Matt Busby was there in his tracksuit and, and football boots on and everything and uh, he used to show us and not only teach us what we were to do but he could demonstrate himself because he was young enough to do that. And this was very new? Oh yes, oh yes, this was, uh, we didn't have manage. The manager was the chap who was in the office but Matt was never one for being in the office, he didn't like that. Busby was once asked about a memorial. He said that he already had one. The three great teams he created for United in 23 years as manager. He considered the babes of the 1950s to have been the greatest. My first idea was to try and build on young boys, young players, and bring them up in the club atmosphere and the feeling for the club and uh, character-wise, loyalty-wise. We had uh, won a championship in 52, and I felt at the time that there was need for a change. Some of the players were getting over the top. And uh, I remember I was going to play a, a friendly game in Kilmarnock, and I, I started ticking over in my mind now, should I put a few of these lads in or shouldn't I? And uh, I remember walking around the Toon Golf Course 
where probably you've played <laughs> golf in the past. And I spent a, a morning going around thinking, 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 will I do it, will I? And eventually I decided, and I put five or six of the young boys in, and it was at Huddersfield, the first match. Mm -hmm. And we made a draw. We played Arsenal the following Saturday. We managed to beat Arsenal. And from then on, it seemed to take a pattern. We had a collection, really, of, of players of great talent at the time. And they were dedicated. They wanted to play, and they wanted to create, and they wanted to win. The first of the home-reared players to be promoted was Roger Byrne, who was to become the distinguished captain of the fledgling side. From his early days, he matured so much. He did mature, Roger. And he actually became a very good leader, really, Roger Byrne. His early days didn't suggest that. He became a very good captain. And... Uh, not only that, a great fullback. Whereas I think if Tom Finney and Stan Matthews were talking about fullbacks, they didn't have much success with. In fact, I never saw either one of the two of them play well against Roger Byrne. He had a tremendous view of a field, uh, where to play a ball. And he used the ball very accurately. And as I say, a, a, his positional sense is, is they seem to smell some situations, and it was always there in the interception. United won the FA Youth Cup for five successive seasons from 1953. The babes were thriving. Eddie Coleman, it was said, shimmied and sent the grandstand the wrong way. David Pegg was difficult to stop on the left wing. Dennis Violet would go on to eclipse Jack Rowley's club record. Liam Whelan's ball skills attracted offers from Brazil. Busby was also prepared to buy to strengthen the blend. Tommy Taylor was signed from Barnsley for the odd sum of £29,999. I says, well, putting £30,000 in this lad said, make put him under pressure. I'll give you £29,999. He says, all right, we'll accept that. So that was uh, Tommy Taylor. The start of Tommy Taylor here, and of course, we all know the greatness of the, the player and his brilliant head work and the contribution he put, made to the team. Above all was the incomparable Duncan Edwards. One day I was talking with Joe Mercer, and Joe had, at that time, had been the, he was captain of Arsenal, and at that time he, he had taken the, the English schoolboys on for a week, doing a bit of coaching with them in Brown about Blackpool. I think it was about 1950, maybe a little later than that. And there was D David Pegg there, Parry, Roy Parry, remember, Duncan Edwards, oh, uh, Alex Farrell, Mark Jones. Oh, such talent there. And the lad that stood out, head and shoulders above everybody else, is this Duncan Edwards from Riley Hill. How old would he be then? 13. 13. And Matt came. And he's looking for Alex Farrell, the local lad who played for Evan, went to Evan. And uh, I said, yeah, we play, and we got talking. I said, well, the best player of that lot is Duncan Edwards. And he says, what's more, he says, he's mentioned it in mind. So that started us after Duncan Edwards and eventually we signed him. The incomparable Edwards at his age. He was quite amazing in every aspect of, of the game, really. Uh, I said to Jimmy Murphy, I said, you know, I've been trying to find a weakness in this boy, and I just can't find one. And of course, as time went on, so it proved, because he had this tremendous ability. And, and, and then he, you see, uh, we played him probably as a, a deep line centre half or a double centre half, as they call it today. And uh, he played it brilliantly there. You, uh, you went up in the midfield, you played in the midfield. It was the same thing. If there was an occasion in one of the matches where the goals weren't coming, you probably pushed them up in front and scored goals. Duncan Edwards never altered playing the way Duncan Edwards could play. He never got it in his mind that he was, he was the greatest. He just went out to, to play the game because he loved every minute of it. The Busby Babes won the championship in consecutive seasons, 1955-56 and 1956-57. We were a group of young boys, or young men, to put it, 
who had all got the same common denominator. We love to play football. And Matt used to say to us, uh, one of his typical team talks was, uh, go out and enjoy yourself. And if the public see that you're enjoying themselves, then they will enjoy themselves as well. And we got the reputation at that time of playing with a smile on our sleeve, whatever that meant. Uh, the, the public really liked it. The man at the helm, Matt Busby, was responsible for that atmosphere. And the atmosphere went right through to every player, you know. To, to hear someone talking about uh, moving because he wasn't satisfied with anything at Old Trafford was unheard of at that particular time. It was a very, very happy club. He'd been an old player, and he'd be bound, he was bound by the old traditions that existed in his days when they never let you see a ball during the week until a Saturday. And Matt was always in favour of us having a ball out as much as, as much as we could. And even when the old groundsman used to come and complain that we were playing on a Friday afternoon uh, while he was trying to get the pitch ready for Saturday, uh, we used, Matt says the groundsman wants to know why you're playing, and we said, would you rather have the best team in England and the worst pitch, or the worst team in England and the best pitch? He said, well, there's no answer to that. You better go out and play on the ground with the ball. They were denied a league and FA Cup double in a controversial Wembley final against Aston Villa. Manchester United, the favourites, and Aston Villa. United have already won the league. Can they do the double? It looks like it until in the seventh minute, Peter McParland crashes into goalkeeper Ray Wood. Wood is carried off, and Jackie Blanchflower takes his place in goal. United never stop attacking. Tommy Taylor and Eddie Coleman are there all the time. Wood comes back on the right wing, but he's a passenger, so United concentrate on the left wing. Although Villa were now leading, United went on fighting. Their only goal comes from this corner by Duncan Edwards. And that's Tommy Taylor heading it home. The progressive Busby defied the Football League's insularity with regard to English clubs competing in the European Cup by accepting United's invitation. In 1957, the team caught the public's imagination by advancing to a semi-final against the holders, the magnificent Real Madrid of Di Stefano. Manchester United are at home to Real Madrid in the second leg of the European Cup semi-final. They have a tough job in their hands, for the white-shirted Spaniards already have a two-goal lead from the first leg. So the Red Devils need a three-goal margin today for an overall victory. From the start, the crowds are treated to a sparkling display of football. Here's Madrid on the attack. Centre forward to Stefano shoots, but goalie Wood tips it round. The French referee is kept busy for plays pretty rough at times. In the Madrid goal, Lismes heads away. A neat overhead kick starts Madrid on the move, and like a flash, they're up the other end, with winger Copa beating Wood for a goal. The Madrid end again. Bill Whelan tries a hook, and Marquitos gives away a corner. A beautiful save by goalie Alonso. And another. The Red Devils keep up the attack, but they can't press it home. And when Madrid break out, inside left Real shows how it should be done. So Madrid are leading 2-0 at half-time, but after the interval, Manchester really start getting down to work. Left winger Peg has the ball. He centres, it bounces off Taylor, and Whelan makes sure of it. So the Red Devils have reduced the gap. But they'd need four more goals to take them on to the final, and the quick-moving, quick-thinking Spaniards make that altogether too much to hope. As the pace grows hotter, manners are forgotten by both teams, and bad tempers mar the game. Manchester score once more, but that's all they can manage. There's an ugly scene when Torres falls after colliding with left-winger Peg. Manchester try to carry him off, and Madrid to pull him back. It's a pity that such behaviour on both sides should spoil the brilliant football which gave Real Madrid their semi-final victory. I was approached to go to Real Madrid as manager. 
take care, take over them. And uh, Mr. Bernabo and the, the officials there said, tremendous salary and we will make a heaven for you in Madrid. And I eventually said to, to Mr. Bernabo, Mr. Bernabo, I'm very grateful, but my heaven is here in Manchester. The following year, United reached the semi-finals again. A 3-3 draw against Red Star in Belgrade secured their place. Then disaster struck. Busby fought for his life in the Rechts der Isar hospital. Well, as you're the Welsh team, the Welsh team played Israel in Cardiff in the World Cup, and uh, my assistant went, Bert, poor old Bert, and he, he had my seat and he went. A taxi from town and uh, got the office at the top end there, and Alma George, who was our secretary then. I went upstairs, and there seemed to be no one. It was more strange, there's no one around at all. And uh, I had a drink, gave her a drink. I said, haven't you heard, Jimmy? He says, I heard about what? See, the plane, the, the plane has crashed. It never struck me at all. And she said it again. Oh, I said, we'll have another drink. I'm a quick drinker, by the way, and answered my second one quickly. But uh, she said it again, and she started to cry. And then it struck me very vividly. I thought, God, no. And last year I thought it was a plane crash. So in my John Little office there, I went in, I, I cried myself for 20 minutes, couldn't realise it. Heartless players you brought up, more or less live with. Very difficult. A city mourned. The world of football mourned. The potential lost was immeasurable. Tommy Taylor, David Pegg, Eddie Coleman, Mark John. Billy Whelan, Jeb Bent, oh, uh, tragic loss, tragic loss for In Manchester, a shaken Jimmy Murphy picked up the baton. No one realised I went through hell come back and I'd known to talk to really. Plenty of people around, but I'm talking at my 11 in soccer. And I just find a team of 11. We played Sheffield Wednesday first at Old Trafford. Sheffield team were in obviously in the program, but I was, I was when I was Manchester United, there were no names at all. Because the team, we didn't know what the team would be in, et cetera, et cetera. But they get locked the gate, there were 66,000 here on the ground. Billy Brooks wins the toss for Manchester United against Sheffield Wednesday. And it's the most dramatic game Busby's Babes have ever played. Wednesday and the striped shirts kick off. Less than a fortnight after the Munich air crash, the Babes are fielding a scratch side for a fifth round FA Cup tie. And apart from Brooks himself, the only member of the original team is goalie Harry Gregg. A Sheffield corner brings a moment of danger. Gregg misses it, but centre half Coke saves the day. And Gregg collects it and clears. Now the United forwards are on the attack, and that was nearly it. Brennan takes the corner, and it's in. Second half, and Manchester United are still incredibly one goal up and fighting every minute of the way. Mark Pearson's shot rebounds, but Seamus Brennan's there to land a beauty. 20-year-old Brennan was only included a few hours before the match, his first big game ever, and he scored two goals. No wonder the crowd cheer themselves hoarse. And the Babes are so pleased with themselves that nothing Sheffield can do worries them now. Harry Gregg's a tower of strength to his youthful colleagues. Time and again he turns defence into another opening for attack. 
17-year-old Mark Pearson has the ball. Alec Dawson's ready to receive, and there's number three. The club had survived, but the man whose ideal seemed to have been destroyed found the pain almost too great to bear. I felt at the time that uh, one of the times when I did eventually come round, uh, why did I take the club into Europe? Why would you go on the plane? I remember my first reaction was never to have anything to do with football again. And this was my mind in my mind. And my wife, my wife went again, come along <coughs> one of these days and said, uh, if these boys had their say that it's passed on, they would want you to carry on. Now that stayed with me for a day or two, or oh, for some time. She quite kept laboring this. Uh, and as probably as it gradually got better, I started saying, well, perhaps she's right. Uh, and from there, I started saying, well, I'll go back, but it's going to be a terrible struggle. I got this stage, I was, actually, I was, in a way, I was, I was terrified to come and look at the ground and feel the, the people at that time. Uh, and as I say, the biggest obstacle, once I'd done it and I'd forced myself to do it, forced myself, I had to do it, uh, there was a sudden relief uh, for me. It was a very trying time. Uh, I think I'd said something of the nature we, we know, we're all aware of what's happened. Uh, <clears throat> we have got to carry on and rebuild this club, this great club of ours, something like that. And uh, I got very upset and I had to go. Had to go. Murphy's scratch team of callow reserves and emergency signings careered on to the FA Cup final, where they met Bolton Wanderers. The teams line up for presentation to the Duke of Edinburgh. Matt Lofthouse presents the Wanderers, and then under the eyes of Matt Busby himself, United skipper Bill Fawkes presents the team which, after the Munich tragedy, very few people expected to reach the final. United kick off with the sun but against the wind. Little Ernie Taylor, Harry Gregg jumps and nearly loses it. Bolton winger Douglas Holden kicks up field. Parry heads and Greg misses. But Fox sends it for a corner. A near one. Holden takes it. It's headed out and Ray Parry brings it back. He centers, but Stan Crowther's there. He clears, but Edwards returns it and Lofthouse runs in for a lightning goal. Less than three minutes play and Bolton are one up already. United are shaken, but they try to hit back. Colin Webster, who's changed over to the right wing, bulldozes his way through towards the Wanderers' goal. He centres, and this might be it. No. Bobby Charlton beats Higgins. Taylor shoots, and a beautiful save by Eddie Hopkinson. United are soon sweeping back to worry him again, but nothing seems able to pierce that Bolton defence. Back and half-backs work smoothly together, and the Manchester attacks break against them like waves against a rock. And time and again, defence turns into attack. But Harry Greggs found his form and holds them off. So the second half starts with Bolton still only one up, but pressing hard and giving Greg little peace. The Wanderers' experience is telling over United's enthusiasm, and Manchester seem to be finding it difficult to work as a team. Brilliant individual efforts peter out through lack of support. Now Bolton winger Birch has it, but Alec Dawson, switching wings again, gets it away. Dawson to Charlton. Charlton passes. Back to Charlton, who shoots, but it bounces off the upright into Hopkinson's hands. Hard luck, Manchester, 
That was Bolton's closest shave yet. After Manchester end again with Bolton moving in fast. Dennis Stephen shoots. Greg parries, but Nat Lofthouse charges in. And there's Bolton's second goal. Nat's charge seemed fair enough, but it's flawed Harry Gregg, and play is held up for a minute or two while the trainer attends to him. It's an anxious moment, especially for Matt Busby, but there's no serious damage, and Harry's on his feet again. Webster runs in and shoots. Hopkinson can't hold it, but Higgins tips it away. But there's the whistle. Bolton Wanderers have scored the fourth cup victory of their history. Reunited, Busby and Murphy determined to build another great side. The loss of a generation of brilliant players had been compounded by the necessity to rush youngsters ahead of schedule. There was no alternative but to buy established talent. Albert Quicksall, Maurice Setters, Noel Cantwell, David Hurd, Dennis Law and Pat Crerand were expensive acquisitions as the late 1950s turned into the early 1960s. The signing of Law for £115,000 was a British record. The investments paid dividends when United won the FA Cup in 1963. David Hurd kicks off. Manchester United in red shirts, Leicester City in white. The cup final has begun. Giles passes to David Hurd and his shot tests Banks. Ferran spots that inside left Dennis Law is well placed. Just watch how that Scottish wonder turns the pass to complete advantage. United have scored the all-important first goal. Law's on the warpath again. This time it seems incredible that City's goal can escape, yet it does. One good thing for United, Bobby Charlton's in great form. He shoots, it goes to Hurd, and it's in the net. Tragically for Leicester, Banks fumbles. Ready to pounce on it is David Hurd. It's all over, the end of an exciting, very sporting game. On the field, congratulations all round. United's captain, Noel Cantwell, leads his men up to the Royal Box. For them all, it's the fulfilment of an English footballer's ambition. The cup and a cup medal. Incidentally, it's a moment of triumph for their manager, Matt Busby. Proof that he has most successfully rebuilt United. We shall never forget the Munich air tragedy. The star of the 1963 FA Cup final was soon to be hailed by the Stretford Enders as the king, Dennis Law. They got this uh, saying of calling someone the king, and I think uh, Dennis Law was the first ever was called the king here. I've been associated with Dennis Law all his football life. Because really, in the early days, our youth team played uh, Huddersfield at Heckman Dwight in a terrible night, and the, the, the there's someone causing a bit of trouble, and I found out it was a blonde little elf called Law. And I went to Andy Beatty after the match and offered him £10,000 for that Dennis Law at the time. He had tremendous skill. He had this uh, great asset of tremendous acceleration. Kid looking for that one, and Law! There it is by Dennis Law! Well, would you believe it? Never come to centre trying to find him. That's low. What a goal! What a goal! Then I saw him as, as his ideal type of player. Yeah. Everything he was looking for. Entertainer, expressive, um, that, that little bit of aggression, you know, everything that you want in a professional player. Law was saying he wants it in the air, so too does Gowling. And Law, in fact, with an overhead kick, and it's there! Though spending, Busby remained convinced that home-produced players were essential to the club's prosperity. Further evidence of the wisdom of that policy emerged in the fragile-looking frame of an Irish youth named George Best. 
He had to be left to do things naturally. He had this tremendous ability. The people were there, they, they just uh, waiting to see George Best, they weren't waiting to see anybody else. Charlton, United moving forward again, Manchester there, George Best with a lot of room to work. Gibbons on his right, Best again! A glorious goal by Best, what a magnificent goal by Best! Brian Kidd to George Best. Fitzpatrick. Best going in on it. Best! Oh, beautifully taken by Best! Now Heard. Good dummy. Has Best up in front of him. This is Best. Wriggling out space. What a fine set! What a fine shot! Georgie Best! Number seven, the incredible George Best scores his 17th goal of the season. Good header by Moore for Best. And a great goal! Making space for his cross and Best! George Best. Sold two dummies and now has made a chance for himself. His hat trick! None of Busby's players enjoyed greater prestige than Bobby Charlton. He was great in, in every way. If he put that uh, jersey on, no matter at the height of his career, he was playing for 90 minutes. If we were, if we were playing a, a small club, it didn't mean any difference. He never relied on his, uh, his name. Uh, you never saw him easing off and saying, we're playing this. But he'd give, he was an example that way. He gave everything he got all the time. And of course, uh, the qualities he had were tremendous. A tremendous rhythm in his movement. It was uh, sort of something that you very rarely see. You used to glide past people in, in ease. And, and then if he sent a ball, he passed the ball a short one or even a long one. It was so accurate. And then you get the position when he came in and uh, 25 yards, he did this sort of I think, shot, finishing off. He scored this goal. Nice little pass there to Kidd. Best going on. Charlton coming up as well. And on the far side, it's Aston. Straight into the path of Charlton! That's the equaliser from Bobby Charlton! Best, Law and Charlton are evocative of a glorious era in which other unforgettable figures also had important roles to play. Nobby Styles, toothless and myopic, but a tiger nonetheless, would win the ball and pass it on to an artist. Pat Crerand, a £43,000 signing from Celtic, was pure geometry. Bill Fuchs, like Charlton, a Munich survivor, commanded respect in the thick of the defence. In goal, Alex Stepney, whom Busby claimed turned a good team into a championship team. Now that Busby had assembled the necessary parts for his pattern of play, he was ready to challenge for the championship again. A superior goal average enabled United to beat Leeds to the title in 1964-65. And another triumph in 1966-67 was sealed with a 6-1 victory at West Ham. There was a period of about five years which was absolutely beautiful. Beautiful from the fans' point of view, it was lovely for, uh, for the players to play under a manager whose basic uh, speech was really, I know you can play football, go out and play your football to the best of your ability. And as long as you've tried your best, uh, you can ask for no more. Win, lose, or draw. So it was a lovely philosophy. And it was a lovely philosophy in that we felt in a team, if we were trailing 2-0, we always had a feeling that we'd win 3-2. <laughs> celebrations had only just begun. United were determined to extend their supremacy into Europe. Re-entry had come with success in the FA Cup in 1963, and the early signs were promising. The Dutch side, Willem II, were United's opponents in the first round of the European Cup Winners' Cup. The second leg of the tie at Old Trafford was a rout. United winning 6-1. The second round was a domestic affair. United meeting Tottenham, the holders, in the first ever tie between two English clubs. Spurs won the first leg in London, 
United made amends by winning the return 4-1. Sadler's pass finds Hurd. He dives to net a beautiful goal. For Spurs, Greaves shoots. Just over. Hurd has the ball. It's a goal. Spurs are two down at this stage, but they're still in the game. Even their defence turns to attack. Right fullback Peter Baker is up there to show what he can do. The ball goes to Jimmy Greaves, and it's one for Spurs. United must have two more goals to win on aggregate. Bobby Charlton scores. A shot by Hurd gives no difficulty to the Brown. In the dying minutes of the game, Charlton scores again. A fine attacking performance in the home leg of their quarter-final against Sporting Lisbon gave United a 4-1 advantage to take to Portugal. all went wrong in the return match. United lost 5-0, their heaviest European defeat. We went over there to Lisbon and expecting it to be... Because don't forget, most of us were fairly new to European football and we expected it to be, well, a, a comfortable victory. And I remember going through, I think after five minutes, and, and in those days the posts were square over there, not like they are now, and I remember beating somebody and knocking it and I thought, well, that's, that's a goal, and it hit the corner and came back out. Well, of course, we could have been 5-1 up then, and then all of a sudden, they hit us with everything. I mean, we never, never got a, a kick at all. They were a very skillful side, but we, as the years went on, we'd have approached it in a far different way. There was renewed optimism when United regained entry to the European Cup in 1966. The mood was heightened by a remarkable performance away to Benfica in the quarter-finals. Benfica kicked off with Eusebio, reckoned Europe's best player in evidence, though Manchester United's defence was not to be caught napping. Dennis Law and the rest of Matt Busby's men had only one thought, attack. After seven minutes, the ball went to George Best. Goal! A shark that to the all-conquering Benfica, unbeaten on this ground for years. But there has to be a start for everything. Best had the ball again. Another goal. Bobby Charlton started another attack. Heard to Connelly. Goal number three. At half-time, United 3, Benfica 0. And being Manchester United, they didn't let up. Champion teams don't make that mistake. Benfica were lucky here. As the Portuguese 11 couldn't score themselves, Shea Brennan put one through his own goal. After an unsuccessful Benfica shot, Bobby Charlton was prominent again. A pass found Crerand. United's fourth goal. It was only right that Bobby Charlton should get one himself. Goal number five. Busby described the 5-1 defeat of Benfica as the team's finest hour. And the rest of Europe took note. We just completely annihilated Benfica that night. Everything went off. Every shot that was probably meant for a goal went in. The tackle, we won the tackle. The bounce ball, we won it. Everything went for it. That was probably the best football that we ever played in my time with Manchester United was the game in Benfica. That was, was near enough perfection. In the semi-finals, United were drawn to play Partizan Belgrade. This is hard, hard football indeed. It's a goal! Oh, beautiful goal! A 
2-0 defeat was not promising. In the home leg, United met with strong resistance from the Yugoslavian defence in a bad-tempered match. Charlton, Charlton. Law not quite able to get there. Heard beaten in the tackle twice. Great full-back play, that. Foul after foul after foul. I can't ever remember seeing a game in quite such a situation as this. The referee not knowing which way to turn, which player to look at. Now warning Styles, he'll send him off. Now arguing with Prund and Melodinovic. And he has sent off, he has sent off Melodinovic and Krund. Miladinovic, the inside left of Partizan has been sent off and so has Pat Quedden of Manchester United. What a sensation this is in a European Champions game. Styles. It's in! He's scored! Styles has scored off the goalkeeper. 17 minutes left and Manchester United has scored 1-0 in this game. The banners wave, the crowd rises to its feet. And I'm losing my voice, I'm sorry to say, but what a goal. Styles, Styles, the hero of United tonight, in defence and in attack. Anderson. Again, Soskic just gets his hand to it. Tanea, the left winger, bringing it away. Styles. Just listen to that crowd. Anderson. Can United get one more and at least earn a replay? The chance at last has come. Charlton header, Soskit save. Charlton. Can we get one last desperate fling? Styles. And there it is. Manchester United, for the third time, have reached the semi-final. And there you see, in their disconsolate players walking off, just how they must feel. The favourites were out of the tournament. The European Cup was beyond Busby's reach once more. Time again to reflect upon United's obsessive quest. They had a team that was good enough to win it, and I think that he felt that. And of course, the, the accident brought all that to an end. Uh, but it was obvious that um, it was something that needed to be done, you know, um, for, the, for the respect to be shown properly to the ones that had died in, in, in the effort of trying to win it initially. May, 1968. One match from realising a dream, United travelled to London for the final against Benfica. Benfica had won the European Cup twice and had also played in two previous finals. United had the psychological advantage of having beaten them in 1966. United also had the advantage of playing at Wembley. Sabio. And that's not a bad one either. Whoa, how this man can hit a ball. Tears in his eyes. Up here, the boys who done us proud last night. The boys who have won honour for the club. The one honour for Manchester. The one honour for England. And uh, I'm very proud to be the manager of these lads who have done such a wonderful job. And finally, up the Reds! Up the Reds! 
that night <coughs> at Wembley it was a crowning glory for us all. For the players that had gone in the crash, for Bobby Charlton and Bill Fox who were members of that team who fortunately survived, even the players, the directors, the head was the chairman and directors, and everybody concerned. It was a night of achievement. You this, gave them a lot of memories that This night. is what was the object of the exercise from the start. To mark the triumph, Busby's achievements were acknowledged on a broad scale. Ten years after being awarded the CBE, he was knighted. Among other honours came the freedom of Manchester. A year later, Sir Matt decided the time had come to take a step back. Sir Matt has informed the board that he wishes to relinquish the position of team manager at the end of the present season. The chairman and directors have tried to persuade him to carry on and it was only with great reluctance that his request has been accepted. The board fully appreciate the reasons for his decision and it was unanimously agreed that he be appointed general manager of the club, which Sir Matt is very happy to accept. Wilf McGuinness, a Busby babe whose playing career was curtailed by injury, was promoted to chief coach and then became the manager of a team which had seen its best days. The new manager was judged swiftly and severely. Frank O'Farrell was next to try Busby's mantle, as Sir Matt settled into the role of club director. O'Farrell was dismissed after a season and a half. Since then, Tommy Doherty, Dave Sexton, Ron Atkinson, and now Alex Ferguson have tried to restore United to the preeminent position the club held under Sir Matt. The great man remained now as United's president, a source of inspiration and advice. Well, it gives me every incentive and uh, all the ambitions that you could ever wish for in a manager. I mean, the great thing about our club is, to, is the tradition. And it's something you don't buy in a chemist. You know, that it's there. And you're proud to have it, and it's the target you have to achieve. And even if you get to sort of a, the, just the fringe of what uh, that the Matt Busby record is like, then you'd be, I think all the supporters and myself and all the players would all be proud of ourselves and would really feel we've achieved something. The influence on others spread far beyond Old Trafford. Bill Shankly loved him. He loved him. A lot of the Liverpool players, when he used to speak to them, you know, they used to say, he idolises Matt Busby, you know, whatever Matt Busby says or goes. I, I always remember... Uh, the two, the two teams were staying somewhere once, at the same time, in the same hotel. And, um, and Bill Shankly never drank. He never drank. But Sir Matt had a drink. And I think he just bumped into Sh to Shanks and he says, Come on, Bill, let me buy you sherry. And Bill Shankly couldn't say that he didn't drink. And he says, all right. And he, he, he took his sherry off, off Sir Matt. And the Liverpool players, I remember, were absolutely staggered. You know? He says, well, that's the ultimate. The ultimate compliment that to, to Mad Busby, Bill Shank has actually took a drink. Every every so often I would I would see Don Revy, you know, um, people like that, managers in the game at the club. And I thought, well, have they come to sign a player or something, you know? And and then I realised it wasn't that. They just they just come on sort of a an educational really. It's an educational visit for them. Busby's skill in the art of diplomacy coupled with an impressive faculty for remembering names, enhanced his avuncular public image. In some respects, this was a facade. Like many successful people, Busby could be hard and uncompromising. It was the end of the season, and I just felt that uh, what I was getting from United was not enough, so I sort of put in a request uh, for more money, and Busby... He didn't look too kindly on that, and before I knew what it was, he had put me on the list. And I was up in Scotland at the time, and of course the press all got a hold of it, laws on the transfer list and whatnot. I thought, gee. So I had to come back down to, <laughs> to Old Trafford, and Busby, and obviously seen Busby in his office, and he's a crafty old devil he was as well. He, 
you know, nice to see you, son, oh, the awful thing you've done or whatever. And then he went into the drawer, pulled out this sort of written uh, reply for, that I had to say to the press, you know, apologize. I thought, you little devil, you. Uh, so I had to come out and he had it all there, ready, you know, before I'd even said it. Sir Matt Busby will be remembered as a visionary. He introduced a youth policy. He realized the potential of European competition. And the three great teams he created were founded on a belief in exciting, attacking football. His legacy is one of the greatest football clubs in the world. People who, who remember Matt Busby from the beginning will always remember that he he, he gave them something, memories, occasions, events, players, um, that, that will give them pleasure thinking about for the rest of their lives. And, it, and it's something that he can feel very, so, very satisfied with, that he's, he's made so many people, players alike, who've come through his hands happy, and people that have watched, he's made them happy.